so it is uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Fred Applebaum. Uh, um, no more fitting a uh, uh, investigator to 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 dis give this lecture this year. Being a disciple of of Don Thomas's, uh, he is the clinical research uh, division director at the Fred Hutchison Cancer Center and um, head of the division of medical oncology at the University of Washington. He is uh, a leader in the field, uh, was a founding member of ASBMT, has been a uh, supporter of the journal and the, and the society, uh, leader in SWAG, and it's with uh, great pleasure that we uh, hear uh, from him today. Fred. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation to give this talk. Um, when I got to Seattle um, in the uh, late 70s, Don was just starting his first series of transplants for patients with uh, uh, AML in first remission, and he recognized that no matter the outcome, there would be uh, speculation about uh, how heavily um, um, censored these patients were and brought in. And so to really uh, understand the implications of transplantation first remission, uh, the first study that I did when I got to Seattle was to take patients who uh, were untreated at the time, treat them with uh, initial induction chemotherapy, and then if they had a matched sibling, uh, they went on to uh, transplants. And if they did not, they would serve as, as controls to get away from the question of uh, patient selection. And we would we eventually completed that study. At the time, donomycin was uh, an IND drug, and so we were able to capture virtually everyone with acute leukemia throughout the Pacific Northwest, but it was a struggle, and Don realized if we were going to continue to do those kinds of comparative studies, we would have to work with uh, cooperative groups. And so uh, early after I got to Seattle, Don took me to uh, my first uh, SWOG meeting. Uh, it turned out it was Don's first SWOG meeting as well. Um, and he marched me up to the chair of the Leukemia Committee, and he said, uh, John, it was John uh, Hutton, I'd like you to uh, meet Fred, and I'd like Fred to be a member of your committee. Um, and uh, John was happy to have me, and uh, I, I joined uh, SWOG at that time, and really it was Don's doing that, that brought me there. Um, a little bit later, uh, I became the uh, chair of uh, the SWAG Leukemia Committee, and I've been blessed to be able to uh, serve in that capacity for uh, a little over the last uh, two decades until this year. Um, and what I'd like to do today is to review some of the experiences we've had uh, in SWOG in AML. We've conducted 15 studies, uh, uh, upfront studies for patients with AML, encompassing uh, inclusion of uh, somewhere over 7,000 patients. And I'm not going to review each of those studies. They've been reported uh, previously, and you can read the manuscripts, or you have read the manuscripts. Uh, but what I'd like to do is to review how those studies have changed over the years. And when you do that, uh, just observations, uh, there are some insights that show up that were, for me, totally unexpected and, and I think surprising, uh, and I also may be helpful in identifying how we can cure more patients with acute myeloid leukemia uh, and also what uh, further studies uh, might be indicated by this. So this is really going to be looking back at, at a series of, of studies, uh, and as Yogi Bear said, um, you can observe a lot uh, just by watching. So first, I'm going to turn to uh, AML, uh, to APL, uh, and we have done a series uh, alone or in combination with uh, the other cooperative groups, and it's been a very uh, collaborative experience, uh, about five major studies in APL uh, over the last uh, several decades. And when we look at the overall survival from uh, study to study, it is incredibly gratifying. Uh, what you see, and the differences between these curves uh, is very uh, easily understandable. Um, we have at the very bottom uh, the study 8600, which included donomycin at 45 for three days in ERSC. Uh, the 8124 study, the next one up, included donomycin, this thing does jump around a lot, uh, uh, 8124 included donomycin at 70 uh, for three days uh, with ERSC. And so this indicates that first big jump is the incredible sensitivity of the disease uh, to anthracyclines. Uh, the next curve, uh, which is the intergroup 0129 study, uh, shows 
shows the impact of having ATRA during induction and maintenance, uh, and particularly early on, you can see much fewer early deaths in APL. Uh, the next study, which is uh, just a second from the top, is the C9710, and that shows you the impact of using um, uh, 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 arsenic trioxide as consolidation therapy for those that are in complete remission. And the final curve near the top, where we're seeing uh, almost a 95 percent uh, survival rate, uh, is the S0521, which uh, is restricted to patients with good and intermediate risk APL, and demonstrates that if you treat those patients with uh, ATRA uh, and uh, anthracycline for induction, give them consolidation uh, with uh, arsenic, and then uh, no maintenance, uh, we still cure a very, very high percent. Now, it's, it's great and gratifying to look at those kinds of curves, but really, uh, they're the gift of three drugs. They're because we had sensitivity to anthracycline, and then we were given uh, ATRA and, and arsenic, and together, uh, they made a, a huge uh, uh, difference in that disease. Well, I'd now, now like to turn to uh, the harder disease, and that's AML. Uh, over the same period of time, we have conducted a, a series of studies uh, for patients with AML uh, less than age 60. Each of these included uh, relatively large numbers of patients. Some of these were done solely by SWOG. Uh, the 9034 was an intergroup study. Um, and uh, when you look at the curves there, uh, again, you see a, a marked increase in five-year survival, going from 11 percent uh, in the earliest studies to 17 percent, to 31 percent, 34 percent, and then up to about 50 percent five-year survival. Now, if the study included transplantation in one of the upfront arms, we've removed that from these curves. So this is just the chemotherapy arms of, of those studies. And while you can easily understand why the APL outcomes came, got better, we had better drugs, it's much harder to understand this because we didn't have any new drugs. This is all anthracycline and ERA-C. So how did this happen? Well, we decided to take a, a bit uh, closer look at this to try and understand it. Uh, and I will talk about uh, the to these follow following topics as we try and investigate uh, that answer. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about primary induction failure, the timing and nature of second induction cycles, uh, transplantation in first remission, the role of gentuzumab, ozogamycin, and then very briefly, the issue of transplantation as salvage therapy. Well, to start off with, I wanted to examine the most recent study, that's SO106. Uh, this has not been yet published. It's been submitted and reviewed, uh, uh, but not yet in print. Uh, and this was a prospective randomized study using conventional donomycin at 60 times 3 in ERA-C uh, compared to uh, donomycin at 45 times 3 with ERA-C and the addition of gentuzumab ozogamycin. The reason that we used a lower dose of donomycin was to try and compare these at equitoxic, uh, make these equitoxic regimens. Patients who got a complete remission were given three cycles of high dose ERA-C based on the CLG B uh, 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 schema, and then were again randomized uh, to gentuzumab uh, or observation. Uh, and when we looked at the outcomes of induction, you see about 300 patients in each arm, about 75 percent of them getting a complete response, uh, a little bit higher uh, rate of resistant disease in the donomycin ERA-C than the donomycin ERA-C GO arm. There's about 5 percent of patients who are called non-evaluable. These are individuals who lived through the induction cycle uh, and oftentimes went on to get consolidation. Uh, but the marrow that was done after induction was non-interpretable. It was either too high hypocellular or it wasn't done, and so we couldn't truly document a CR, and so for the purposes of this study, they're uh, viewed as non-accessible. Uh, and then we have the treatment-related mortality, and what you see is in the control arm, we have a 1%, 1% treatment-related mortality, uh, which I find to be astounding. Um, so that when we treat patients now in a multicenter cooperative group, the chance of dying during the pancytopenic period before patients either get a complete remission or are shown to have resistant disease is 1% in this arm and a little bit higher and statistically significantly so in the GO arm up to 4%, but still remarkably low.
Now, I was surprised at this, and so I wanted to go back to previous SWOG studies and ask how had this changed over the years. Uh, and uh, I, I also wanted to look at another group besides SWOG. And so uh, Eli Esty is now uh, at, in the, at the University of Washington at the Hutch with us. And I said, Eli, can you get the data from MD Anderson, which he was happy to do. And we looked together uh, at the cohorts of patients from 1990 to 1995, 1995 to 2000, 2001 to 2005, and then 2006 to 2009. So every five years. And these are large cohorts, about 1,000 patients in this this group, this group, this group, and 500 in this group. And their median age is just around 60 for all uh, of these groups. And you see a very consistent change that's happening every uh, five years, going from a 17 to 18 uh, percent mortality rate, uh, 1990 to 1995, to a 13 percent five years later, uh, to 10 percent uh, five years later. And then uh, in the most recent uh, uh, regime, we're seeing a very low rate of mortality during induction. And so there are uh, several implications of that. Uh, number one, it tells you that uh, doing historical controls may not be a very good idea. Uh, but number two, it also raises the question of could we in fact uh, uh, increase the intensity of our in induction regimens given how well we're doing. Now, it also raises the question of why have these induction rate, uh, these induction deaths uh, fallen, and we don't really have a firm answer. If you ask me, of course, I would say that this is better supportive care. Uh, we have much better anti-emetics, so people aren't vomiting and aspirating. Uh, we have much better antibiotics and particularly better antifungals, uh, probably better blood support. And I suspect something else that we doesn't get enough play is we're much more attuned to nosocomial infections and their prevention on our ward, and so we don't see nearly as much C. diff or uh, multi-resistant uh, organisms on the wards. But it also raises the question, uh, if people aren't dying during induction and we're still only getting uh, about uh, 70 to 75 percent in, in CR, what's happening to all these people who are living through induction but not getting a complete response with two cycles of seven and three? And so we wanted to look at that and we went back to S0106. We said, well, what's the survival of our primary induction failures? And I have to tell you, I really believe this was going to be close to zero. Uh, well, here's what we found. The five-year five -year survival of primary induction failures on S0106 was 26%. That's about as high as our complete response five-year survivors were uh, in uh, two previous studies ago. Uh, and as Keenan Thompson on Saturday Night Live might say, uh, what's up with that? Uh, so we, we wanted to try and find out what was going on here. Um, was this what had happened previously? Uh, and so when we look back at our previous studies, and the answer is no. Uh, the primary induction failures when we started uh, 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 the last uh, 20 years was down about 1%. Uh, 1%, then going up to 7%, then 12%, then 20%, and finally uh, 26%. Now, one of the uh, sad things about having reduced funding uh, for cooperative groups uh, is that when patients fail, uh, we stop collecting data on them except survival. Uh, and that's really a tragedy because we don't really know how previous therapies affect subsequent therapies because of that. It's just a, a, a reality. And so what we had to do to find out what really happened uh, with these patients who were primary induction failures is we had to go back and send emails and calls to every one of the investigators that entered these patients on study. And Megan Othis and I did that over the last uh, three to four months. And I want to thank every one of you who answered our emails and provided us with the data. And here's what we found. Of 169 patients who are primary induction failures on SO106, uh, there were eight that we still haven't been able to uh, find the answer to, uh, but uh, that won't change the outcomes. Uh, there are 161 where we have firm data. Of those 161, 46% actually made it to a transplant uh, and 54% uh, uh, did not. And when you look at the survival of those two curves, it is remarkably different. So that is the outcome of transplantation for primary induction failures, almost 50% which, I, again, I thought was uh, quite shocking. Uh, for those who didn't get a transplant, it was virtually uh, zero. And I would say that Megan puts the zero above that bottom line in the way that she makes her curves there, as you can see. Um, now, you could all easily argue, well, you have to stay alive long enough to get the transplant, uh, which is true enough. And so we redid the analysis just looking at those patients who were alive more than 90 days after the uh, start of induction, and the curves really don't change uh, hardly at all. Uh, and what is interesting is that between 75 and 80 percent of patients who entered onto the study 
who were primary induction failures were still alive at day 90 and therefore presumably uh, could have potentially gotten transplants. Now, we also looked at the data. Uh, these patients in large part had failed two cycles of seven and three, and so then they were treated in many of the different centers. There was no, uh, uh, they, of course, it was up to the investigator on how to treat them, but usually were treated with a high-dose ARC containing salvage regimen, and about 45 to 50 percent of them did achieve uh, a remission. Uh, and of those that were in remission, uh, the outcomes for transplantation were uh, at least looked to be superior than those who weren't. But even in patients who failed two cycles of induction and then failed reinduction with high dose RSC, we still had about a 25 percent uh, disease free uh, overall survival uh, going out between three and four years, although the numbers are relatively small. It didn't seem to matter if we used a matched unrelated or a matched sibling donor. Uh, the curves are identical. And uh, finally, it also uh, didn't appear uh, to show a difference between ablative and non-ablative uh, preparative regimens. But of course, there's a huge bias here in that uh, generally people would not use the non-ablatives if there was overt leukemia at the time the patient was transplanted. And more of the patients that got the ablative regimens had overt disease at the time of transplant. But again, not much difference between the two. We did note, going through this, that the majority of patients who actually got a transplant tended to be at centers where they were induced and it was at a transplant center. So if you were at the Hutch or you were at University of Michigan or if you were at Stanford, more often you would have failed the two cycles, get a salvage regimen and get onto a transplant compared to um, the groups that were at uh, small community hospitals. Still, 45 percent of patients getting a, a, a salvage transplant for primary induction failure I think is, is quite important. Impressive, and there are two reasons for that, I, I think. Uh, one is that part of SO106 is that everyone was typed at diagnosis. And number two, we had talked quite a bit about this uh, in the SWOG Leukemia Committee. But how does this really play out in the community as a whole? Um, and um, that's shown here. These are data from SEER in 2012. According to SEER in 2012, there were 13,780 cases of leukemia, AML, in the United States last year. The median age is just about 66, right in the middle, and so we're going to assume that half of those were of an age where nobody would argue that they were potentially transplantable, about 6,890. Uh, a third of them were primary induction failures. That would mean that there should be 2,067 primary induction failures. And as I told you, about 80 percent of them would live long enough to get a transplant to day 90. So that's a 0.8 of that. It means that there should be about 1,654 patients who could be transplanted for primary induction failure. According to the CIBMTR last year, we did 316. So that means that in 1,338 patients throughout the United States, we lost an opportunity to potentially cure those individuals. Now, the next intergroup study, S1203, uh, is an intergroup study, and one of the things we're going to do in that study is we are going to, at diagnosis, not only get cytogenetics and mutational analysis, but everyone is going to be HLA-typed, and the NMDP has agreed to do that for free, so you don't have to worry about insurance. And the NMDP will immediately start an unrelated donor search on every one of those individuals. And so for those people who fail to get into complete remission, we'll be working with with the investigators to try and get them to a transplant uh, and see if we can improve uh, the numbers that get to a transplant and then study just how well can we do this and what uh, will the outcomes be. I'd now like to move from primary induction failure to the question of the second induction cycle. And this topic came to me when I was asked to write an editorial about a paper that was submitted to JCO and published. And it was from the Polish group in which they compared donomycin at 60 in ARIC to donomycin 60 ARIC in cladribine. Uh, and what they found was the addition of cladribine improved the CR rate and improved overall survival. It was a randomized study. They had a third arm with flirabine, but for our purposes here, that's irrelevant. Uh, now, it seemed to be a straightforward study, but I was struck with how poorly uh, their donomycin 60 in ARC actually did. And when you compare it to a contemporaneous, the contemporaneous study that we did in SWOG with donomycin 60 in ARC, what you found was that the CR rates with the first cycle of therapy was exactly the same, 50%. But in the SWOG experience, when we give a second cycle of 7 and 3, we get at least 20% more of our patients into complete remission, up to about 
In the Polish group, they didn't. They got very few patients into CR with their second cycle. And I wondered why. And so when you read the paper carefully, uh, what you see under the methods section is how they monitored uh, the outcome of the first cycle. Uh, we do at SWOG what the NCCN recommends, and that is that after you give seven and three, you wait a week to ten days and you do a bone marrow. If there are residual blasts at that time, we recommend that a second cycle of induction be started. In the Polish study, they did not do that. They did not recommend a second bone marrow until counts recovered, and then you would do the second bone marrow to show that the patient was in remission, or you waited until you could see peripheral blasts to reappear, or you waited until day 40 if they didn't have peripheral blasts and they didn't have recovery of counts. And clearly it would seem that that delay uh, made that second cycle of induction much, much less effective. And so the general recommendation would be to give that second cycle early, but do we actually do that? I would say that there's huge practice variability throughout the United States in, in that. And in fact, when we look back at SO106, only about half of the patients actually got their second cycle of induction on time, even though they had persistent blasts. Now, we couldn't figure out exactly the reason why, and so we looked at our own experience right at the University of Washington, and we looked at 178 patients who were induced with standard uh, induction, and about 20% of them had greater than 10% blasts uh, at the day 14 to 18 marrow. Uh, but only half of them started the second cycle of reinduction on time. In the basic, we couldn't find any reason why, and there was only one thing that was really different. If you had lots of blasts, people were quite willing to start that second cycle of induction right on time, but if you had lower numbers of blasts, 20, 30, 35 percent blasts, ten, people tended to wait and said, well, we'll wait for the mucositis to clear a little bit, maybe we'll have some recovery of granulocytes. Um, and certainly from the experience, uh, if you take it to the extreme of what the Polish study showed us, that's a very bad thing to do. And so we generally would recommend that patients get that second cycle of induction uh, on time. Now, it also begs the question of what should that second cycle be? Uh, conventionally, we give seven and three induction, and if we don't clear blasts at uh, day 14, we give a second a cycle of seven and three. Is that really the best thing to do? Or given the very low mortality rate we see with induction chemotherapy, should we escalate uh, that second cycle that we give it uh, uh, before day 28? Uh, and one of the goals, of course, uh, would be to try and get not just remission, but a good quality remission that has no minimal residual disease. Uh, and why would we want to do that? Well, we know so further chemotherapy tends to uh, give a better outcome if you start in uh, molecular complete remission. And even if you go to transplant, and this is uh, studies that have uh, been done by Roland Walter from our institution, uh, we looked at about 250 patients. If you're transplanted for AML and first remission with no minimal, minimal residual disease as determined by multi-dimensional uh, flow cytometry, 10-color flow, which can detect about 0.01% blasts, um, your outcome is far better uh, than if uh, you are transplanted in first remission with minimal residual disease. And now, nobody yet that I know of in the modern era, when we have such good supportive care, has done that randomized study. That is, give seven and three if you have residual blasts at day 14, then randomize patients to get seven and three versus perhaps a more intensive high dose RC containing regimen. I think it'd be a very interesting study to do. Uh, we are piloting the uh, second arm at the university in the Hutchinson Center right now uh, just to prove that it is doable and to see how many good quality. Uh, CRs we achieve uh, with that approach. Well, while we're talking about AML and first remission in younger patients, uh, these are data that have come from the uh, European uh, leukemia net. Uh, and with the current risk uh, categorization of AML, we have four groups. Uh, there is the favorable group, uh, which includes the CBF leukemias, those that also have mutations in CBEPA, uh, and those uh, that are NPM1 mutated and FLT3 negative. If you look at patients who are 60 years or younger, both in the European and the CLGB experience, uh, this is about 41% of patients who are um, uh, uh, with AML 60 years or younger. Now, in this group, uh, at least in the past, uh, the prospective studies have suggested that there is no clear uh, improvement in overall survival if they're transplanted in first remission. Uh, 
Uh, in those that have intermediate one and intermediate two, intermediate one being normal cytogenetics but not the favorable mutations, uh, or intermediate two, uh, T911 or other clonal cytogenetic abnormalities that are neither favorable nor adverse, these groups do quite a bit more poorly. And in fact, it looks like the in uh, the intermediate two does a little bit worse uh, uh, than intermediate one. Um, according to Clara, uh, both these groups do uh, quite poorly. This one a little bit worse, and of course this group does terribly. Uh, and in meta-analyses, as well as, as the studies that have been done, these 60 percent of patients all appear to benefit uh, from transplantation in first remission. Uh, well, how many actually get a transplant in first remission? Uh, and now uh, we uh, believe that uh, we should be able to transplant uh, virtually all of them because we have data that shows uh, here from, again, the Hutch that matched sibling outcomes uh, uh, versus uh, unrelated donors give just about the same uh, survival. This has also been uh, shown by the CIBM uh, TR. And additionally, uh, in a slide that you saw this morning from Colleen Delaney, uh, the uh, experience certainly uh, in the um, at University of Washington Hutchinson Center shows that our survival with cord blood uh, for ablative transplant plants are the same as what we've seen for unrelated matches. And I have to say, I, this surprises me. Uh, early on, I would not have thought that this would turn out to be the case, but um, as we gain experience, it does seem to be the case. And so if you accept matched siblings, matched unrelated, and cords, we should be able to transplant virtually everyone with high-risk AML. Well, how many do we actually transplant? Again, Going back to the SEER data, there are 1,780 cases of AML. Uh, about half of them are below age 65, and therefore clearly in the transplantable age. Of those, uh, about 0.4 are favorable, and we would expect that the CR rate should be about 80%. And so if you take 6,890, multiply it by 0.4, and then multiply uh, the result of that by 0.8, you come up with 2,204 patients. Uh, that would be in remission with good risk disease that don't need to be transplanted. On the other hand, when you take that 6,890 and multiply it by 0.6, and take the product of that and multiply it by a CR rate of 0.65, uh, we should see about 2,687 patients with poor risk AML who make it into first remission and therefore should be candidates for transplantation. How many actually were transplanted in the United States last year according to CIBMTR? 945. And so here we have another lost opportunity of over 1,700 patients to give them the best chance uh, for long-term survival. Um, and so again, in S1203, we are typing patients at diagnosis, we are conducting the unrelated donor search, and for those who get into first remission, we will try to transplant every one of those that has high-risk disease and see what proportion we can actually get transplanted and what the, in fact, overall outcome will be. Uh, Dan gave just a great talk last night. Congratulations, Dan. It was uh, masterful. And uh, there is just one little part here that we're going to overlap, uh, talking about AML in the elderly. Uh, this is a slide that Dan showed, which uh, uh, showed that um, the compared to CLGB chemotherapy, uh, when you do a case-controlled uh, comparison, outcomes of transplantation appear to be a, a little better. But of course, as Dan also commented, uh, these uh, patients that were actually transplanted uh, are probably very highly selected. And just how highly selected uh, is a matter of question. This is the study from Eli Esty, uh, where 259 patients uh, were, uh, came into the study. And at the end of the day, at MD Anderson, they were able to transplant 14. Uh, Richard Stone likes to call this study the many are called few answer study. Um, now, Eli moved from MD Anderson to Seattle, uh, and now this is not a comparison between the institutions. I want to make that very clear. It's a comparison of time, because when this study was done, uh, transplantation for older AMLs was less accepted, and certainly the use of uh, unrelated donors was probably less accepted. And so we've redone this study uh, in Seattle. Uh, and what we find is of those who we induced between ages 50 and 75, uh, between these years, we found 81 patients patients who made it into complete remission, and we were able to transplant 65% of them. Not 10%, but 65%. Uh, the reason that we couldn't transplant patients were in 10% because of early relapse, 7% because of comorbidities, 6% uh, because the patient or the physician did not want to go ahead, and in 3% because of finances. I would make the point here that what you don't see 
in the group that was not transplanted was a lack of donor. That was not an issue for any of these patients because we were willing to use matched related, matched unrelated, single antigen mismatch, particularly at DQ, and in a few cord blood. And so if Dan's going to do the study which he'd like, that is a donor versus no donor comparison in older age groups, we would have to agree arbitrarily that those that have mismatched unrelateds and cords would have to be viewed as the non-donor group to make that, that comparison if we were going to go ahead and, and do the study that he talked about. Uh, well, uh, again, how many patients, older patients with AML are getting transplanted in the United States? Uh, if you agree that uh, the age group that could be transplanted is uh, 60 to 75, which is what Dan talked about last night, uh, there are about 3,445 AML patients. We'd say that a CR rate might be 50%. Perhaps that's a little pessimistic, but that would be 1,772. Uh, we actually do 400. Uh, and so that means, again, a lost opportunity of over 1,372 patients who might have a better chance for long-term survival uh, were they transplanted. Uh, I'm now going to turn very briefly to the uh, topic of gentuzumab ozogamycin because that was the subject of uh, the study that uh, I mentioned, SO106. And I thought I'd just want to tell you very briefly the story of gentuzumab, which really began in the 1980s uh, when uh, a, a number of us uh, were interested in the idea that maybe uh, we could improve the outcome of transplantation uh, instead of giving TBI if we gave antibodies uh, targeted uh, radiotherapy that would go to the bone marrow and cause more dose of radiation there in spare the liver, the lung, uh, uh, the GI tract. And so I started working on that uh, in, in the canine model. We developed monoclonal antibodies against canine marrow. We radio-labeled them. We showed we could ablate the marrow and get a transplant. And then we wanted to go back into the human uh, situation. And so uh, Irv Bernstein was developing antibodies against early myeloid progenitors, and he had one against CD33. And so Irv and I developed a collaboration. Irv gave me the CD33 antibody, which we radio-labeled with iodine and gave as part of a preparative regimen. Uh, and I'll never forget the very first patient we gave it to. Uh, we were infusing it. The patient was lying under a gamma camera. Uh, you could actually watch the radio label go into the bloodstream and go right to the marrow, and the marrow lit up like a Christmas tree. And we were ecstatic. Uh, I went home, and before I was asleep, I already in my mind had half written the New England Journal article that was going to document this. Um, we brought the patient in the uh, next morning and put the patient under the gamma camera, and we were aghast to find that the marrow was empty, uh, that there was no radio label left in it. And, and what had happened, obviously, is that the, uh, we showed uh, subsequently in the laboratory, is that the CD33 upon antigen binding rapidly internalizes. Uh, the I131 is clipped off by deiodinases and is excreted right from the cell, and so the uh, residence of the iodine in the bone marrow was so short that this would never work. Work. And so what we've since moved on is to use anti-CD45. Uh, you heard a little bit about that uh, uh, earlier today, um, which is a cell surface stable uh, antigen. Uh, and we also figured, well, why not make, try and make you know, a silk purse out of a sow's ear? Uh, and if the uh, CD33 internalizes, could you put a toxin on it and make that a, a target for therapy. Uh, and so Irv worked with a number of groups uh, putting Abrin and Ricin on it and then made a collaboration with uh, Lois Hinman, who was at literally, uh, Letterly, uh, to put Polichymycin onto the CD33. And this worked gangbusters in, in the laboratory uh, and in animal models. And so that became gentuzumab ozogamycin. We did the phase one study uh, in Seattle and showed that uh, we had CRs. Uh, and uh, when we did a phase two study, we got CR rates of uh, about uh, between 25 and 30 percent in patients who had relapsed, first relapsed AML uh, untreated. Uh, and with that, uh, we had uh, uh, approval, accelerated approval from the FDA. Uh, now, we all know that that's since been rescinded, and I'll talk a little bit about why uh, in, in just a few minutes. Um, but uh, I want to make the most important point here, uh, and that is that when we started this work, uh, Irv and I did not imagine that this was going to work for every patient. Irv had shown that if you take AML from patients who, have, who were G6P heterozygotes, and you treat that AML with CD33 in complement, what you get left over in some cases was non-clonal hematopoiesis, expressing both G6PDA and G6PDB, suggesting that the leukemia in those individuals began in a common myeloid precursor uh, and that the stem cells left behind were normal. 
But in other individuals, when we treated the marrow with the antibody and complement, what was left was still clonal, suggesting that the leukemia began in a precursor that was before expression of CD33. And so we always suspected that this drug would only work for those individuals who had uh, leukemia that began in a more differentiated precursor. Now, for those of you who went to Scott Armstrong's elegant talk uh, yesterday morning, Scott has now shown this so dramatically uh, he has been able to take mice and in the true stem cell, the most immature stem cell, uh, he's put MLL in and he gets leukemia. But if he then takes a common myeloid uh, granulocyte precursor, he can also put MLL in. He also gets leukemia and that leukemia is much easier to kill with chemotherapy. So it's a great model for what we have with our good risk versus our poor risk AMLs. Well, with that background, um, we went ahead again into the study where we randomized patients between uh, donomycin erysi versus donomycin erysi and gentuzumab. Uh, again, they got high-dose erysi and were subsequently randomized. And what we found, unfortunately, and, and this will be uh, coming out uh, in, in press shortly, is that there was only, there was no real advantage. This is the arm with gentuzumab and this is the arm without, and those are not statistically different. Now, you could argue, well, gentuzumab makes up for the lower dose of donomycin, uh, and that might be true, but that's hardly a reason to approve a drug uh, because it makes up for what you already can do with, with a higher dose of donomycin. When we looked at good risk patients, however, what we found was, again, a, a, a substantial difference in that the cure rates in those with favorable risk cytogenetics were higher in the gentuzumab arm than in the uh, control arm. Uh, and this goes for both disease-free and for overall survival. Now, one could argue this is a uh, this is a uh, retrospective analysis, and that holds very little weight. And if this was the only example, I would agree with you. Uh, but of course, that's not the case. Um, we can look at a number of studies. This is the study from Alan Burnett, the AML15 trial, in which patients were randomized between chemotherapy, three different chemotherapy arms with or without uh, myelotarg. And uh, what Alan has uh, since published is that the overall survival is statistically significantly better overall for the inclusion of gentuzumab ozogamycin. And that is particularly the case in those who have favorable risk disease, a little less so in those that have intermediate disease, and it is lost in patients who have poor risk disease. Uh, many of you may have also noticed the recent paper that came from the French group. Uh, this is the ALPHA trial, Sylvie Castain, uh, recently published in Lancet Oncology. Uh, in this study, you can see there was overall an advantage for survival with the inclusion of gentuzumab with induction chemotherapy, and that was most marked in those that had favorable or intermediate risk disease. Uh, it was lost in those that had unfavorable risk cytogenetics. In fact, there have been five prospective randomized studies now published or reported uh, uh, comparing chemotherapy with or without gentuzumab. Uh, and in uh, all of them, there is an advantage uh, to gentuzumab in the favorable risk group. Uh, in four of the five, this translates into an overall survival benefit because it is seen both in the favorable and the intermediate risk. Uh, unfortunately, in the SWOG study, uh, it did not. And in the SWOG study, it is the only study where we did see increased treatment-related mortality. Uh, but remember, our control group was ridiculously low with a 1% treatment-related mortality. Uh, and the control of the treatment arm looked more like what we previously had seen historically. Unfortunately, the only study which was presented uh, as a post-approval proof study uh, to the FDA was the SWOG study. And uh, the FDA can't really respond to studies that aren't presented formally to them. And so based on this study, uh, uh, gentuzumab was withdrawn from uh, commercial uh, sale, uh, unfortunately. Uh, the final po uh, point I wanted to make is that um, uh, what happens to patients uh, on these chemotherapy arms uh, when they relapse uh, and what's happened over the years? Uh, and this shows the outcome of subsequent studies, sequential studies in patients who were on the chemotherapy arm and then relapsed and presumably could be transplanted at uh, first relapse. And as you can see, here too we've seen progressive improvement every year as we've gone from uh, the earlier studies to the current studies from 5% five-year survival to 9% to 15% and currently uh, to 23% uh, uh, outcome. Uh, and now, how many patients actually get transplanted in this setting? Uh, well, 
we feel that there's at least uh, 1,100 patients uh, who relapse after chemotherapy in the United States and only about 500 are transplanted less than age 65. And if you add all of these together, that is all the possible uses of transplantation versus the actual, what do you find? Well, remember we talked about the primary induction failures, 1,600 versus 300, first remission, 2,700 versus 900, uh, first remission over age 60, 1,300 versus 400, and it relapse, uh, again, these differences. We do about 2,200 transplants for AML in the United States each year. And without a stretch, that is, without asking people to be transplanted for relapse disease over 65, uh, we could probably do um, at least three times that number, uh, or 6,800. To say it another way, uh, every year in the United States, uh, over 5,800 patients less than age 70 die of AML. Over 5,800 die of AML, and yet we're only doing 2,200 transplants overall. And so clearly, uh, we're not uh, uh, saturating uh, the market as well as we should. So, what I tried to tell you uh, over the last uh, uh, 35 or 40 minutes, uh, uh, here are a number of uh, specific uh, conclusions. Um, at least 25% of primary induction failure patients can still be cured. Uh, Transplant-related mortality uh, of AML induction has dramatically decreased uh, from uh, upwards of 20% to uh, 2 to 3%. Second induction cycles should be given early in patients with persistent leukemia, and I believe this is the right place for research about what that second cycle ought to be. Outcomes of related, unrelated, and cord blood transplantation are similar, particularly for patients who are given ablative transplant preparative regimens. Overall, hematopoietic cell transplantation is underutilized in younger and possibly in older uh, AML patients. Uh, and um, if I had my way, uh, I would make gentuzumab available uh, for selected uh, AML patients. Uh, at least if it doesn't become available, others uh, now believe that CD33 is a legitimate target, and we see the CD33 bite uh, being developed or uh, new CD33 conjugates, and so we may have another um, uh, crack at this uh, in, in the future. Um, the last major conclusion, and it's not a specific conclusion, it comes from these curves, these are curves in two sequential SWOG studies showing patients that fail induction or relapse, uh, those are the ones that come off that curve, and then overall survival. And as you can see, those curves are almost overlapping. And so when we did the study, if you fail the study, you fail. But when you look at SO106, these are the patients who fail the study, that is, they fail to get a CR or they relapse, yet here is the overall survival. And now we're seeing quite a bit of difference. That is, there's really an effect of what we do to salvage these patients. And so we can't ignore the impact and the interaction between what we do as initial therapy and how it interacts with subsequent therapies that we give. And so my overall final general conclusion is that given, given the coming partition of AML into multiple subsets and the substantial potential for interaction of individual elements of AML therapy, and this is going to be hard, but future clinical trials need to consider the overall treatment strategy rather than just a specific individual element. As one example, should a patient with intermediate risk AML be transplanted up front? Or should they get intensive chemotherapy, be followed very carefully, and be transplanted at the first moment of relapse? Now that's a question that the people that are paying the bill would like to know, because they'd like to know which one of those effects uh, is, is the most, uh, uh, uses the most uh, um, uh, resources in terms of overall utilization. And, and much more importantly, that's the kind of answer that the patient wants to know, because they really don't care very much about one specific intervention. What they care about is what's going to give them the best chance to survive long term. Well, obviously, I've talked about a, a number of a smattering of many different things. Uh, I cannot possibly 
possibly uh, thank uh, all the colleagues I've worked with enough. Uh, I've been blessed to work uh, uh, with a great group of individuals uh, in the Southwest Oncology Group. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with the other cooperative groups and the other cooperative group leaders. Uh, of course, we have a great group of uh, AML experts uh, uh, in the non-transplant arena at, at the Hutch. I want to particularly thank Irv and Eric Sievers, uh, who collaborated on the original concept and development of gentuzumab. And uh, finally, of course, the uh, uh, Hutch uh, transplant team. And uh, if I really included everyone here, I'd go to a whole nother page. Uh, incidentally, I, I want to specifically uh, thank Chris Doney, uh, who provided me with some of the pictures I showed uh, earlier today uh, when I uh, spoke uh, about Don. Uh, and, and finally, of course, uh, the person that has been well, the two people that have been by far most influential uh, in my professional career uh, and the people for whom uh, this lecture was named. Uh, obviously, I can't uh, thank enough uh, Don and Dottie Thomas. So thank you all very much. Thank you.